Hi, everyone. Hi, Yossi. Let me just introduce you very quickly. I'm Stephen Kepnes. This is Yossi Klein Alevi, a very well-known commentator on politics and religion. Uh, in Israel, he's originally from the States and has been living in Israel many years. Uh, he's written a number of very important books, uh, one of them, Like Dreamers, and he's also a fellow at the Shalom Hartman Institute in Jerusalem. He's going to speak for about uh, 40 minutes, and then we'll take questions. As I mentioned before, if you have further questions, Anat, where is Anat? Is here. Uh, she has cards, and you can write them, and I will ask the questions to Yossi. Uh, furthermore, I just want to say that the event is sponsored by Jewish Studies, the Center for Freedom and Western Civilization, and the Office of the Provost and the Dean. And uh, I'm very quickly going to turn it over to you, Yossi Klein-Halevi, my dear friend. Thank you, Stephen. And uh, thank you, really, for the opportunity to share with you all something of uh, what we're going through here in Israel. Uh, I'll be speaking from an Israeli perspective, and I think that's important to say. Uh, Palestinians are going through uh, their own trauma at the moment, uh, especially uh, innocent civilians in Gaza. Uh, what I'd like to do is really try to unpack for you something of the emotional, psychological, and political and military dimensions of what this moment means for, for, uh, for us uh, Israelis. So before I, I speak about the political and military dimensions of this moment, I'd, um, I'd like to say something about the personal experience of what we're what we're going through and why this moment is such a watershed in Israeli history and I would argue in in the history of the Jewish people as well. Israel really functions as a kind of extended family. It's often a dysfunctional family as uh, if any of you were following the news uh, over the last year, uh, you would have seen mass demonstrations uh, every Saturday night for the last 10 months, hundreds of thousands of Israelis, which in a country of 9 million uh, is, uh, is an extraordinarily high proportion, uh, would go out of their homes to demonstrate against the Netanyahu government and its plans for what they euphemistically call judicial reform, and those like me who were out on the streets every week uh, called a judicial coup. It was an attempt really to destroy Israeli democracy and to undermine the most important democratic institution we have, which is the Supreme Court, and um, to effectively turn Israel into a version of Viktor Orban's Hungary or Poland or Erdogan's Turkey, uh, for that matter, something like Modi's India. If you look around the world, you'll see uh, a growing number of democracies that are turning uh, into quasi-dictatorships. And in Israel, we had what I think is the strongest democracy movement anywhere in the world. And we basically stopped the government from implementing its uh, its worst uh, its worst plans, and I'm mentioning this uh, because, first of all, in Israel, we what we went through in this last year was a breakdown of the sense of family. The two camps that emerged, the pro-government camp and the democracy camp, saw each other as threats to the future viability of Israel. And it was a very, very bitter divide. It wasn't just about politics. It was about the long-term ability of Israel to maintain its identity as a Jewish state, the state of the homeland of the Jewish people, and a democratic state, a state of all of its citizens, whether or not 
they are Jews. And the symbol of the protest movement was a um, an Israeli flag. If any of you saw the images of our demonstrations over the last year, you would have been struck by one overriding symbol. And that was literally thousands or tens of thousands of giant Israeli flags. Now, think for a moment in your political context. When you have liberal or progressive demonstrations going out against, for example, the Trump, the, the Trump administration, I at least don't recall seeing a sea of American flags. And in Israel, things work a little differently because the liberal opposition refused to allow the right wing to appropriate the national symbols. And so I would have this very strange experience of walking to, to a demonstration with a large Israeli flag and the people on the street would know some of them might be hostile, some of them might be favorable, but they would know that because I'm carrying the national flag, I am part of the liberal opposition. Now, again, if you think about that in an American context, it seems almost surreal. But in Israel, what we were fighting for was Israel, Israeliness. We were fighting to uphold the dream of a Jewish and democratic state. And we were accusing the government of subverting the Israeli ethos. And during this last year, one of my main concerns as a citizen in a country that is under permanent siege and can find itself at war at literally any moment is what happens if we're attacked? How will this fractured society possibly come together after all of this bitterness? And that was really, I'd say, a major fear among many of us here. Have we gone too far in our divisions so that we're no longer quite functioning as one, as one people, as one country? And I think that that dilemma will certainly be familiar to uh, to you in the United States. Has the political divide become so bitter that you not only can't you hear the other side, because the other side represents to you a, a threat to your literal existence, but in some sense, the other side becomes evil. And I was worried that we were getting to that point in Israel. Fast forward to last Saturday on the Gaza border. And there are a number of extraordinary elements of what happened this past week. But one of them was the way in which the entire country pulled together as if we hadn't been tearing each other apart for the last year, as if we hadn't been calling each other traitor and fascist and and, and as if we hadn't been dividing into such deeply antithetical camps. And here we were suddenly, literally, literally overnight, one people again, determined, united, enraged, not at each other, at Hamas, at the murderers. And this is something that if I could see any silver lining in this unthinkable moment. And I'll try to unpack for you in a moment why I, I believe it is an historic event. The only silver lining is that it's restored to us a sense of commonality, a reminder why Jews are in Israel, why Israel means so much to the Jewish people, and why so many of us have fought for Israel and we're ready, if necessary, to give our lives for Israel. And that's a very common sentiment and experience among Israelis. It's not, it's not patriotic bombast. It's, it's an expression of this deep sense of gratitude that we feel 
for being alive at a time when the Jews, when the great Jewish dream of a return home has been actualized. And also a deep sense of responsibility for being the caretakers or the custodians of the fulfillment of this dream of 2000 years of Jewish history. And that's why I moved to Israel from my home in the US in 1982. I've been living here for 40 plus years. And that's why Jews have come here from Russia, Ethiopia, Morocco, Poland, Yemen, from literally 100 countries. Because we all recognize that this was the moment that the Jewish people had been waiting for, for these thousands of years. What made the events of, uh, of this last week so stunning was not just the horrific nature of the atrocities. This wasn't just collateral damage of civilians in war. This was a systematic massacre of 1,300 people. And I won't go over the atrocity stories or the images. You can find those if you like on online. But what really struck Israelis most deeply about what happened to us was that this violated the deepest part of the Israeli national ethos. And that ethos was never be a victim again and never be helpless. Israelis despise victimhood. We don't revel in our, in our victim identity. We, of course, deeply uh, honor the memory of the Jews who, who were killed in the Holocaust, but the Holocaust is not why I'm in Israel. The Holocaust is not why Israel exists. Israel exists because it's home, and I'm very uncomfortable when there are analogies made, even now, even with this massacre, to the Holocaust. And the reason for that is that what Israel is all about is that we're not victims. And I don't, I don't want to be pitied. I don't want to be considered a victim. And I'll say something that might be a little hard for some people to hear, but I would much rather be condemned and hated than pitied. And I think in that one line, I've summed up what most Israelis believe this country is about. This is about Jews defending themselves. It's about Jews hitting back harder than we get hit. That's the Israeli ethos. And that's at variance with a lot of what contemporary Western thinking is about. And in that sense, it's true. Israel is a little bit out of step with um, with the prevailing with the with the times. And what struck us so profoundly was that thirteen hundred Jews were killed, and they died helplessly, not with guns in their in their hands, but many of them were bound and shot. Um, Again, I won't go on with the details, but it was the helplessness, even more than the deaths themselves. The fact that the army was so ineffective in saving 1,300 Jews, the fact that, that the border was left wide open, the army wasn't present, this is what was so hard for us more than anything else. And, and again, you know, I started by saying that Israel is a family and we're following every funeral where the whole country is weeping, literally. We go through all the stories where we know the stories, the names 
of the people who were killed. But even more painful than the mourning is the fact that they died helpless. And that's what is so untenable for the Israeli Jewish psyche. That, that, because I don't want the world's sympathy. I don't want the world to be mourning. I want us to be able to defend ourselves and I'm ready to pay the price of being condemned. And I think that what, again, what I've just said to you now, almost any Israeli uh, would say to you today. The Jewish people's decision to recreate a state and reclaim power and create an army meant that we lost our innocence because powerlessness conveys a kind of purity, a kind of innocence. And, and I'll come to the occupation soon. I will discuss the dark side of power and the price, the moral price that we've paid. But what I want to say before I unpack the Palestinian tragedy is that what Hamas reminded us of this week is why the Jewish people resumed, returned to power. And we returned to power because there is objective evil in the world. And because apparently Jew hatred is an incurable illness and the Holocaust was not able to end anti-Semitism. There's more anti-Semitism around the world today from the far right, from the far left, uh, than maybe at any time in our, in our history, because it's more global, partly because of social media. We're experiencing anti-Semitism in a much more global sense. But Hamas has reminded us that we had no choice but to lose our innocence, lose our purity and assume the moral burden and responsibility of power and of self-defense. Now, much of the debate that's happening on campuses, uh, in progressive circles, is to what extent Israel brought this on itself. To what extent uh, is the occupation responsible for uh, for this for the Hamas act, and did Israel create this desperate this desperation? And the subtext of that is really the question that should be asked openly, because in all of its ugliness, uh, did we deserve it? Did these people deserve to be killed? Now, you have to understand the nature of Hamas and what Hamas's goals are to begin to answer that question. When Hamas issued its statements about the attack on the Jewish communities on the border, it called them settlements. And it said that Hamas has launched an attack to liberate part of Palestine. Now, these communities, which Hamas calls settlements, uh, are within Israel's internationally recognized borders. For Hamas, there is no difference between Tel Aviv and a West Bank settlement. It's all occupied Palestine. There is no legitimate Jewish majority state in any borders. And so any Jew is a settler, uh, and any settler is a legitimate target. And therefore, Hamas did not kill innocents. When it killed babies, it killed, it killed future soldiers. It killed um, future occupiers. And so for Hamas, there are no Israeli innocents, and there is no legitimate 
country called Israel. If you look at the Hamas charter, it doesn't use the word Israel. It calls it the Zionist entity. Now, when, when I hear people say that the occupation causes terrorism, from an Israeli perspective, it's exactly backwards. Because what terrorism does, and we have experienced terrorism even before the creation of the State of Israel. Anti-Jewish terrorism in this land goes back 100 years. The State of Israel exists 75 years. And what the terrorism, the relentless terrorism, the war against Israel's legitimacy, the war against Israel's existence, what all of that has done for Israelis is convince a large majority of us, including many people like myself, who support a two-state solution, who desperately want to end the occupation, first of all, because it's a disaster for Israel, a moral disaster, a political disaster, a demographic disaster. I see the occupation as a long-term threat to Israel's existence. But what terrorism and, and this event in particular this week reinforces in the Israeli psyche is the fear that if we leave the West Bank, what exists in Gaza will be repeated there. And we will have another Gaza-like state, but this time five minutes away from Tel Aviv and Jerusalem. And so Israelis say, if I give up the West Bank, will I get, will I get peace in return or will I get more terrorism? Now, I haven't seen polls asking that question recently, but that was a question that was asked in, in polls that I've seen over the years. And a strong majority of Israelis, when asked, do you believe that withdrawal, withdrawing from the West Bank will give us peace or more terrorism? The overwhelming majority of Israelis answer, more terrorism. Which is, whether that's right or not, is for the moment irrelevant. What's important is that this is what Israelis deeply believe. Israelis believe that we will not get peace if we withdraw. We'll get more of what we got last week. It will make us more vulnerable. Now, to understand how Israelis see the occupation and the conflict, you need to go back to the year 2000, which in the history of, I, I would call it the history of the Israeli psyche, uh, was a seminal moment. In the year 2000, the uh, Oslo peace process came to an end and President Clinton convened a, um, a meeting with Prime Minister Ehud Barak and Palestinian President Yasser Arafat, and for the first time, Israel put an offer on the table that included a two-state solution. It was a, it would offer about seventy-five percent of the West Bank and and all of Gaza. Arafat walked away and said that wasn't good enough. A few months later, about six months later, President Clinton put an offer on the table that became known as the Clinton proposals. Israel said yes, and Arafat walked away. The Clinton proposals would have given the Palestinians almost the entirety of the West Bank. Dozens of settlements would have been uprooted. All of Gaza would be in Palestinian hands. Jerusalem would be divided. And the main Palestinian concession was that the refugees and descendants of Palestinian refugees from the 1948 war would be resettled in a Palestinian state and not in the state of Israel. No Israeli government would agree to a mass resettlement of Palestinians within the state of Israel. That is the end of a Jewish majority state. And so the deal was Israel withdraws from the West Bank in exchange for the Palestinian agreement that refugees and their children would be resettled in a Palestinian state. That was the Clinton proposals. Arafat said no and launched a four-year war, which was known as 
the second intifada of four year war of suicide bombings. And that became the great trauma until this weekend, uh, I would say within in Israel's history, not only because of the nature of the terrorism, but the fact that the terrorism followed Israel's offer to withdraw and create a Palestinian state. And so if you ask Israelis today, why don't, why don't you sit down and negotiate peace? Most Israelis will point to the year 2000 and say, we tried, and this is what we got back in return. Now, I have to say, but before I, 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 I come back to that point, there's one more, one more element here in understanding the Israeli psyche. And that is that indicting Israel as having the primary or sole responsibility for the occupation not only overlooks Israel's peace initiatives and the Palestinian rejection of those offers, but it also doesn't take into account how Israelis see this conflict. In, in the West, understandably, the conflict is seen as Israel versus Palestine. Israel has all the power, the Palestinians have no power. Israelis see this conflict very differently. I would say that we have a kind of a split screen in our heads. One side of the screen is Israel versus Palestine, and there we are, Goliath, and the Palestinians are David. The other side of the screen is Israel and the Arab and Muslim worlds, and there the balance of power looks very different. And when you factor both of those conflicts together, then you can begin to understand the complexity of how Israelis understand what's happening, the dilemmas that we face. Now, I agree with the Israeli narrative that we offered peace and the Palestinian leadership rejected it on several occasions. The last time was in 2009, when Prime Minister Ehud Olmert offered President Mahmoud Abbas uh, a withdrawal that went even further than the Clinton proposals, and Abbas never got back to him. But I do think that Israelis let themselves off the hook a little too easily when we say, well, we tried to make peace, the Palestinian leadership said no, and now, if they want to make peace, they know where to find us. And the reason that I find that attitude inadequate is because as the powerful side, as the occupier, it's our responsibility to put a peace offer on the table on a regular basis. Even if the Palestinian leadership will reject it, then put the onus on the Palestinian leadership. My responsibility, and I, and this is my responsibility, first of all, to myself, because the occupation is such a threat. My responsibility is to be actively pursuing peace. And it's not good enough to say that in 2009, I put an offer on the table and they said no. Now, I have to tell you, in all honesty, that I believe that even if we had the most left-wing government in Israel, instead of the terrible government, that we have today, it would not, I don't believe, it would bring peace. I don't believe the Palestinian national leadership is ready to accept the legitimacy of the Jewish people's return home, and instead continues to see our return home not as a re-indigenizing of a, of a rooted people, but as a colonialist Western invasion. Now that the fact that we are seen as a as a colonial Western invasion would be incomprehensible 
to Israelis. First of all, um, Israel is a major the majority of Israeli Jews come from countries in the Middle East. They don't come from Europe. They come from Morocco and Iraq and uh, and Yemen. Uh, and um, the notion that Israel is a Western colonial construct is in fact a Western colonial idea. <laughs> and it has no resemblance to the reality that Jews live. And so until the Palestinian leadership isn't prepared to acknowledge that we are not a colonialist invasion, but an indigenous people just like the Palestinians, then I, as someone who desperately wants a two-state solution, will not be able to trust the possibility of land for peace. Because if I'm a thief, if I'm a colonialist, if I have no legitimacy, if my whole history in that land is a lie, and what you read in the Palestinian media and what you hear in Palestinian schools is that the Jews have no history in that land. It's all a Zionist lie. There was no ancient Jewish presence. There was no temple on the Temple Mount. The Holocaust never happened. All of Jewish history is one big Zionist lie. That's what Palestinian children have been taught for generations. And so if that's the case, then who do I make a two-state solution deal with? How do I negotiate peace? Now, that presents an unbearable dilemma for me, because on the one hand, I see a continued occupation, as, as I mentioned earlier, literally an existential threat for Israel. And for, I'm not for the moment speaking about what this does to Palestinians. I'm speaking now as an Israeli and what this does for my own society. I'm speaking as someone who served in the army, who served in Gaza, and who came out of that experience desperate to end the occupation. And that's one half of my psyche. The other half is, just as I see the continued occupation as an existential threat, I see the creation of a Palestinian state under present conditions to also be an existential threat. And so my conclusion is I must withdraw from the West Bank and I can't withdraw. That's the Israeli dilemma. That's the Israeli liberal dilemma. Stephen, how much time do I have left? Uh, <clears throat> we have a half hour. So if you want to speak for uh, 15 minutes and then take questions or maybe 10 minutes and then take questions. Great. Okay, great. So uh, I'll uh, I'll wrap up with, uh, with what's next in Gaza, in the region. Uh, what can we expect this war? How, how will this war progress? And what are some of the long-term political prospects after the war. The overwhelming consensus in Israel today, I'd say this ranges from left to center to right, is that the Hamas regime must be destroyed. Now, that statement contains within it horrific possibilities. First, again, first speaking as an Israeli, Hamas has kidnapped over 150 uh, Israeli citizens, and including babies, including old people. And if we wage an all-out war to bring Hamas down, if we go after the Hamas leadership, as I believe we will, and I believe we must, what we're really doing is condemning 150 hostages to death because Hamas has already said it will execute them. And one thing that I know about Hamas is that they keep their word. We should, we should, take, we should trust what Hamas says. 
At the same time, I worry about 20-year-old Israelis being caught in the Gaza quagmire. I worry about massive numbers of casualties. And, and again, this isn't a volunteer army. Everyone's in. All of our kids, all of our friends' kids, our family, everyone's in. And the prospect of, of large numbers of fallen soldiers, there's nothing abstract about that in Israel. This is a very small and intimate country. Everyone knows everyone here. And finally, and not least, is that there will be, God forbid, large numbers of innocent Palestinian casualties. The nature of the fighting in Gaza is that Hamas is embedded within the civilian population. Hamas fires rockets from schools, from mosques, from neighborhoods, onto Israeli neighborhoods. And until now, Israel has been very careful to, as much as possible, target Hamas fighters. That's not to say that there haven't been large numbers of civilian casualties in the past, but th those were never deliberately targeted. That is not Israeli policy. This time, my sense is that if, for example, the army finds out that there is a Hamas leader hiding with his family, my sense is the decision will be made to hit. In the past, the Israeli Air Force would refrain from targeting deliberately. Sometimes, again, mistakes happened. But to deliberately target a Hamas leader if his family was present was something that didn't happen. This time, we are in an all-out war. That's the real meaning of what happened on Saturday. Saturday was a declaration of genocidal war against Israel. That's how we've internalized it. That's how we've experienced it. And there is virtually no difference among Israelis today, again, from left to right. Now, what can happen if and when we do bring down the Hamas leadership? My hope is that the Palestinian Authority will return to Gaza and that the Saudis and the Gulf states will invest heavily in rehabilitating Gaza and in creating a different basis for a Palestinian state. The next, bear in mind that this is a very delicate moment because we're not, we're not only speaking about the possibility of a limited war between Israel and Hamas. There's fighting that's periodically breaking out between Israel and Hezbollah in the north. Hezbollah is a far more formidable enemy than Hamas. And behind it all is Iran. This is really an Israeli-Iranian war that's being fought by proxy. And my sense is that there is a, there's a real likelihood that this war is going to expand to include Hamas, Hezbollah, Syria, and ultimately Iran. Now I'll wrap up with uh, what this means potentially politically in particular for a Palestinian state. Wars in the Middle East always create change, sometimes for the worse and sometimes for the better. The Yom Kippur War of 1973 led to the first peace agreement between Israel and an Arab country. It was Anwar Sadat and Menachem Begin's peace treaty, which is still the template for future peace agreements. My hope is that what will emerge is a, an Arab-Israeli 
peace front, which will include the Gulf states, the Saudis, Egypt, Jordan, Israel, and that together we will figure out how to create a Palestinian state that will not be a security threat to Israel, that could mean arrangements of a joint Israeli-Arab-Palestinian security force, again, massive economic investment in a Palestinian state. And the reason that I'm looking to the region for a solution is that this is a regional conflict. It is not, again, it is not only a Palestinian-Israeli conflict. And a regional conflict requires a regional solution. And part of that regional solution will need to be rehabilitating the refugees around the Middle East, the descendants of Palestinian refugees, compensation for Palestinian refugees for what they lost in the 1948 war, and at the same time, compensation for the million Jews who were thrown out of the Arab world uh, in the late 40s and 1950s, and like the Palestinian refugees, lost their entire property. This was a wholesale destruction of Jewish communities that had existed in the Arab world for 2,500 years. Some of these communities in Iraq, uh, in, uh, in Yemen, uh, in, uh, in, in what is now Iran, uh, these are communities that go back 2,000, 2,500 years. And within a single generation, they were completely expelled and the entire Arab world was ethnically cleansed of its ancient Jewish communities, and most of those Jews settled in Israel. And so there are lots of issues that are going to have to be solved in a regional context. For the first time, I believe that we have a chance to really begin conceiving of a regional solution. So I suppose that the bottom line conclusion is that the coming months are going to be brutal. I would say the worst in Israel's history and the worst in, in, in Palestinian history, the, maybe the worst times for the Middle East. But I also see the possibilities of finally finding an alternative to what has seemed to be an insoluble problem for, for many decades. So let's let's open for conversation. Thank you very much, Jesse. Thank you so much. Um, uh, there's been a couple of questions on the difference between Hamas and the Palestinian Authority. You've mentioned them a number of times as as the possibility for them to retake over Gaza. I might. I, could you talk just a little bit more about the creation of the PA and its its possible role here and how it, it's going to be affected you uh, by by this Gaza in, in, uh, event. Yeah, yeah, I appreciate the question. It's an important question. Uh, I'm not a fan of the Palestinian Authority. I mean, right now, when I look at my government, I look at the Palestinian leadership, whether it's uh, the PA, the Palestinian Authority, or Hamas, what I see is a disaster all around. Uh, I see, I see governments that that have no commitment to peace. Uh, this is the first Israeli government that is explicitly, explicitly uh, more in favor of annexation of the territories than of peace. And that's, and on the Palestinian side, I believe that it's true for them, for their leadership as well. But what we've seen over the years is that Israel can do an arrangement with the PA in a way that we can't with Hamas. We have joint security patrols. We have security arrangements with the PA because Hamas is, is our common enemy. Israel and the Palestinian Authority effectively cooperate against Hamas. Now, I don't believe that that's a strong enough basis for a peace treaty, but it is the basis for arrangements. That's why I feel that bringing the Palestinian Authority into a post-Hamas Gaza is 
a first step. It's not good enough. And that's where we're going to need the region to come in. But I certainly can work with the PA, even if I don't believe I can make a definitive peace agreement with them. At least not now. I hope that's Okay, clarified. we have a number of questions about the Nakba and about uh, victimhood experienced uh, continually by Palestinians. You mentioned your own feeling of um, victimhood in this event. But so the questions are, one question is why is Israel never apologized for the Nakba, the 1948 uh, war, which caused many, many uh, uh, deaths and uh, exile of populations. And uh, well, maybe you can address that. Yeah, it's a great question. Why is Israel never apologized? No, no, it's, it's, it's a great question. Uh, I would say that in the context of a peace agreement, we we are going to need to apologize. At the same time, I expect Arab countries to apologize to the descendants of the Jews who they despoiled and expelled. We have two refugee populations in this conflict. And and the reason that I say that Israel needs to apologize in the context of a, of a solution is because, as I mentioned earlier, a majority of Israeli Jews are descendants of families that were expelled from Arab countries. And no Israeli government could get away with apologizing for the Nakba if there isn't an Arab apology to its Jews for the expulsion. So that's that's in terms, I don't know if that's a moral answer, I don't know if it's a political answer, but I can tell you that the, the, the political reality in Israel is that the Israeli public would not tolerate a one-sided apology, which in effect takes all the blame on ourselves. The other element here is that Israel, in 1947, accepted the UN partition plan, which would have created two states. It would have created a Palestinian state. The Palestinian leadership rejected UN partition, along with the entire Arab world, and tried to destroy Israel. Now, I have to tell you, in all honesty, Israelis do not feel guilty for what happened. And the reason they don't feel guilty is because what they'll tell you is we tried to make peace. We tried, we went for a two-state solution. And instead we were attacked literally three years after the Holocaust. There was an attempt to destroy the Jewish people. And don't expect us to feel guilty for defending ourselves against a war of destruction. So when we talk about 1948, as opposed to, I would say, the occupation today, which I think we need to own uh, and apologize for. 1948 is different. 1948 is much too close to the roots of this conflict. And to ask Israel to apologize is to ask us to accept all the blame for this conflict. And I don't know any Israelis who would do that. That's a very, very short answer. Uh, I can tell you that, um, forgive the the, the self-promotion that I'm about to do, but I wrote a book called Letters to My Palestinian Neighbor, uh, which, uh, which has an epilogue of Palestinian responses to my letters. And it's the, it's the first book that really tries to create a conversation about these issues between an Israeli and Palestinians. And I go into a lot more detail about uh, the complexities of Nakba apology, these, these questions. Uh, if you do get the book, get the paperback edition, because that has the Palestinian responses. Thank you. So. Bringing it back to the, the moment and specifically to Netanyahu, I have a question. Um, is Netanyahu in his government in some ways responsible 
for the dysfunction of the IDF and its failure to uh, see the this upcoming um, incursion by uh, Hamas. I um, it's hard for me to talk about the Netanyahu government without um, without starting to sound a little bit unhinged. So uh, I will I will try to control myself and just give you a one word answer. Yes, yes. <laughs> uh, my 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 only qual my only quibble with the question is not in is the Netanyahu government in some sense responsible in 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 its entirety. This is entirely on Netanyahu and his government. The lack of preparation. The fact that Netanyahu was concerned only with trying to extricate himself from his trial and 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 weakened Israel to the extent where 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 this could happen. Uh, to my mind, Netanyahu is a um I'll stop there. You can, the, fill in, the, you can fill in the blank. The global issue of is this going to derail the uh, Saudi Arabian uh peace initiative temporarily yeah. temporarily it also depends how the war plays out um, look what this what the saudis and the jordanians and the egyptians uh are saying to israel privately is not what they're saying publicly privately they're saying to us this is your chance to free the whole middle east of hamas Publicly, they will denounce us as aggressors. And uh, that's part of the Middle East game. Uh, the peace agreement with the Saudis, which I believe is the pivot for a different Middle East. And I know the problem with the Saudis. I'm not a fan of the Saudis. I know all of the problems of dealing with the Saudis. But compared to the to the Iranian regime they are relatively a positive force in the Middle East I emphasize very strongly the word relatively uh, I believe that there will be uh an Israeli Saudi agreement and while this may temporarily derail it it will actually make the agreement stronger in the long term a number of people in taking it back to America ask, is this Israel's 9-11? Look, I, I happen to have been visiting New York on 9-11, uh, and I, I saw the towers burning. I, I, I wasn't downtown. I was in Midtown, and I was standing on Fifth Avenue watching incredulously. And I experienced something of the trauma that Americans went through. I don't want to say that this is worse or or less severe or as or as severe, but it's different. It's different because no one in America seriously believed that in that taking down the twin towers was an existential threat to the future of America. In Israel today, most of us see this attack as an literally an existential threat to Israel's long-term survival. And the reason that I say that is because what Hamas did was signal to the whole region that Israel is vulnerable. It is signaled to the Iranians, to Hezbollah, to the Syrians, that Israel is now weak. And to be weak against the enemies that we face is to invite catastrophe. And that's what's on everyone's minds here. So what I'm and that's also the context in which to understand why Israel feels it has to destroy the Hamas regime. Because this isn't only about Israel and Hamas. It's ultimately about Israel and Iran and all of its allies in the region. Israel right now has one goal and that is to restore its deterrence. Now, we have a very big dilemma in Israel. And the dilemma is that 
the more actions we take, hardline actions, to make us safe in the Middle East, the more we endanger our friendship and our position in Western opinion. And this is a very painful dilemma for Israel because we don't know how to square this circle. On the one hand, if I'm not ruthless against Hamas and Iran and Hezbollah, more atrocities like we saw this week, those atrocities are going to accumulate. But the, the more we act ruthlessly, the more we undermine our, our, our alliance with the US, with the West. And this is a tremendous strategic dilemma for Israel. And what I would say is that certainly today, after the events of this week, most Israelis would say to you, uh, with a heavy heart and deep, deep regret, we need to make sure that we're safe in the Middle East, even if it means losing uh, some of some or much of our support and understanding for us in uh, in the West. Thank you so much. I, I'll the last question I'm going to give to a student. Is there anything we can do to help? I have family in Israel and have asked them, but I feel somewhat helpless. Feels like there's nothing I can do. What can we do to help? So let me say a few things. Immediately, there are relief organizations that are working outside of the government framework. To, um, to help the survivors of, uh, of the events of last week with food, clothing, shelter, psychological counseling. Uh, I wish I could say that there are equivalent non-governmental organizations that I trust in Gaza. The problem there is that Hamas controls everything. And I don't know. I, mean, I, I hope there are equivalent organizations. And if there are, those, those really need to be supported. But I would urge you to really look and make sure that there's not Hamas involvement with those organizations. The second thing is something that I would appeal to all of you uh, on an American campus. And that is don't bring this war to, uh, to your classrooms. What we need are, is an open heart for Palestinians, and Israelis. Before we even get into the politics, before we get into the history, before we get into the future, don't demonize either side. Palestinians are not Hamas. Israelis are not Netanyahu. Be very clear that these are two traumatized peoples. And yes, Israel has more power versus the Palestinians. But don't forget that Israel is also alone in a very hostile and dangerous region. It's a very complicated problem. Don't simplify it. One of the great crimes that one can do in this conflict is to turn this into a kind of a passion play of good versus evil. There is good and there is evil in this conflict. Hamas is evil. The settlers who burned Palestinian homes a few months ago, are evil. But don't demonize both peoples. And listen to the narratives of both peoples, because both peoples have a case. Both peoples have a story that really deserves to be heard, to be honored, and to be politically expressed. That's what has to happen here. And so at all costs, avoid those who would turn this into a, um, a, 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 a story of, of almost a, a quasi-apocalyptic story of the demonic 
versus versus the purists. Not, neither side is pure here. And neither side, I'm speaking about the people, are demonic. So take a deep breath, read, learn, listen to both sides. That is a tremendous contribution that all of you can make as um as 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 people who are part of this conflict because America is part of this conflict. So that's that I would say that's my closing words to all of you. Yes, thank Klein you. Levy, thank you thank so you. so much. Please listen to our thank you all very much.